Kassel, as he sent me uh, 100 person per room in Geneva and 20 person per room so on. <laughs> so, and the title of his talk is Mix Effective and Multiplicative Pagodic Theory. Nice, right, thank you. And uh, yeah, it's quite an honor and humbling uh, for me to speak uh, on this occasion, marking two important uh, anniversaries. And uh, as everybody else, I'm, I have great admiration for the Israeli school of, uh, and the Jerusalem school of ergodic theory. And uh, yeah, moreover, I have many friends here in the audience, so I'm very happy to be here. So th this picture in the background is a simulation of uh, maybe Brownian motion or a random walk on an isometric group of hyperbolic plane. So this is the hyperbolic <laughs> disk with Poincaré metric. And, and you see how this process, uh, all a bit confused in the beginning, uh, converges to point on the boundary. And so the sub-additive uh, ergodic uh, thing will come from measuring the distance from the starting point to time n or time t. And the multiplicative ergodic theorem that I refer to will, will sort of be convergence to the boundary but in an appropriate <coughs> sense, so very weak sense, but, but uh, quite general. So I, I came in contact with this subject uh, now quite some, or a few year, some years ago in a, uh, in a PhD course of, that Magulis taught. Uh, so one semester, and it was essentially only devoted to the paper of first and barrier of boundary processes and uh, no, boundary <coughs> theory and stochastic process on homogeneous spaces. Uh, Okay, so let's uh, go to introduction. So by, oh yeah, so I'm sorry about these lines. Uh, it's not some incompatibility with the, my file. And I couldn't make such a landscape <laughs> in the record. But I, so I hope it doesn't destroy the visibility here. But uh, okay. Very, Very yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe I should say it's, I, I did this on purpose. So introduction. So let me go back to a, an earlier paper of Furstenberg. So characteristically, very eloquently written. So I st I'm stealing this uh, introduction in this paper that's been cited hundreds of times. And, uh, contains many original ideas, as many of you know, of course. And uh, so he recalls the classical law of <coughs> large number, which concerns the asymptotics of uh, sums of uh, in the <coughs> IID variable, they having real numbers. Uh, so they commute, and he asks, it's uh, find it natural to ask, what, what can you say about non-commuting products? So, so the, the elements now, the random elements, uh, xn, xn minus 1, uh, taking values in a group instead. And uh, th this is also written in a, uh, or reiterated in a book, Probability Mesh on... Um, on uh, algebraic structures by Gernander in, in the 60s, uh, who, ha who added also that it's not so clear how to formulate such a uh, limit theorem when the, when the variables don't commute. Now, of course, uh, IID variables, so the very important case of matrices, we studied, uh, there are many deep theorems, and many of you are responsible for them. And so uh, I will not uh, recall, I cannot uh, recall all these, but uh, so I will study one particular suggest one particular answer to this uh, sort of question, uh, which probably can be interpreted in many ways. But so for ergodic, so when, when the sequence is stationary, so a bit more general than the IID. OK, so let's see. So I'll I do like in the problem session, I'll start with the theorem and then explain afterwards. <laughs> so, so, I don't, so I can stop at any time. Uh, so we have T. <coughs> T, a um, uh, ergodic measure preserving system of a, of a probability space, omega mu, and uh, we're given an ergodic co-cycle. So this is another way of writing this x1, x2, up to xn. So, the randomly so these are randomly selected elements which I take as isometrics or something more general, non-expanding maps of a metric space. And so I will explain why it, this is a sort of general um, uh, s setting in a, in a while. Uh, so this will be our random product of new commuting elements or random walk on, on a group. And so the theorem is uh, proved with the Le Drapier in the case of isometries and more recently by with Sebastian Guzel this year that for almost every omega there is a, what I call 
metric functional. So for, for time being, this is what uh, probably some of you know, it's a horror function, but I, I will recall and define this uh, in a while, such that the, the trajectory, it may be displayed here, um, uh, with the same rate as it escapes. Uh, okay, e either it doesn't, it moves sublinearly, okay, uh, end of story as far as this goes, or it moves linearly, and in that case there is sort of a direction uh, and it goes into these horror balls with the same rate as it escapes. So, this ho so if this is supposed to be the hyperbolic plane, this is, I didn't have a circle writing on my program, I don't understand why, but so these are my circles, so either it indicates it's a different metric space or, yeah, so you can interpret it. But basically the kind of philosophy is that when you have linear rate of escape, you kind of converge in direction. But, but notice here that this is for any metric space, so, uh, so whatsoever. So th the hyperbolic plane is, of course, a nice one. So this is uh, quite general, and therefore, uh, I mean, it's, this picture is not the right picture for all metric spaces. H but is yeah. by uniquely, uh, uh, No, uh, yeah, H is random, and so D is the metric. So, th so this measures the rate of escape, which is, this is known to exist this limit by the subadditive ergodic theorem that I will recall. And this H is random, that's like the direction. But I will recall what the H is in a while. Yeah, semi-contraction, one Lipschitz map, or non-expanding map. So it doesn't, so I guess I forgot to uh, define uh, at this point. But uh, X is just a starting point, say. Yeah, for any X, for any x, uh, n yeah, it doesn't because uh, th these are semi-contractional, one Lipschitz. So any, if you have x and y, and they, these orbits will move like this, or possibly converge. Mm. So, they, so then the, for the rate of escape, the linear rate of escape, it <coughs> you divide out by this constant. That depends. So na now, okay, so maybe it's a mistake to not define the horror function at this point, but Okay, uh, so, but I, I want to, so this is quite sort of abstract. So I was also a bit worried that it's abstract. So, so it implies, for, for example, when X is a GOMO hyperbolic space, this implies that you have this convergence. This picture is pretty correct. And we, but that was known by, proved by Kaimanovich earlier. And uh, for CAT zero space, it's the same, a little bit more complicated picture, but <coughs> that was also known in a theorem of Margulis and myself. So, but what about other spaces? And so one can think maybe they're a bit abstract setting, but there turns out to be, so I want to just exemplify two settings, corollaries, to just give you an idea that even if you don't know what these horror function or metric functions are for a specific space, then you can conclude something. For example, a random walks on group, suppose this finite degenerate group of sub-exponential growth. By entropy uh, criterion, Aves, Versi, Kalmanovic, Dernik, uh, that implies that this space is Louville, and so that measure we get from the theorem that stationary m must be invariant, and by the horror function property, this will give you a homomorphism. But if you don't have any homomorphism, you can conclude that the drift, the linear drift, must be zero. And there's a version for Riemannian manifold. Louville implies sublinear. And but that's sort of so the the metric <coughs> function works in the background, just abstract. Uh, Properties, but then also there are other metric spaces which are, which are not cat zero or, or anything. But, uh, because horror function they've been used in positive curvature and also been used in non-positive curvature. But but they are kind of useful also for other metric spaces that has no curvature, like metrics that more of similar <coughs> type as uh, operator norms. So for example, if you take a IID product of so here's a kind of genuinely nonlinear uh, kind of corollary. IID product of homeomorphisms. So the X are now homeomorphism. You act on alpha. Alpha is a, oh, it's supposed to be a picture, a picture from Thurston's revolutionary paper, preprint on the surface dynamics. But this is probably my fault. I don't know where it went. But uh, this is, alpha is a simple, so we have a, we have a high genus surface, and so you have a, simple closed curve, alpha, and now you act by 
homeomorphism. You see how, how the length of this curve, measured in some metric, it's not important which, up to isotopy, uh, and uh, see how this uh, grow. And so for the iterates of one homeomorphism, this was in Thurston's paper. That so in some sense, then, that, this, that homeomorphism have some type of eigenvalues or Lyapunov exponents. And so th by using uh, Thurston's asymmetric metric on Teichmüller space and the Cormac-Walsh uh, observation that uh, identification of this horror, horror function, uh, one can deduce this. <laughs> so this is in perfect analogy with one of the theorems in the in the paper of Furstenberg that I displayed uh, the first page of. So instead of, so in that paper there were IID matrices in, in, a <coughs> in, in SL, uh, SLN. Uh, alpha is a vector and this would, instead of uh, this length, take the norm and then you have a uh, convergence. On this. So this is an analog. And then there is a, uh, yeah, for if you relax these uh, non-elementary groups, so you can have more exponents. There's a uh, in the linear in the matrix case there was a paper Fustaber and Kiefer, and for homeomorphism, but also for out automorphism of free groups, uh, there is a paper of Cami uh, Orbez who, who proved this. So, th so there's some kind of genuinely non-linear ex Lyapunov exponents. Okay, so that that was uh, okay. There's some kind of statement and uh, and now uh, I go back to kind of basic definition so first <coughs> about metric spaces to really define what the metric fun what I mean by metric functional okay so so first of all uh, why uh, this setting is uh, quite general is because it is metrics are quite uh, commonplace in mathematics uh, okay so so here's the definition of semi-contraction, by the way. So for any points x and y, you, know, they, you, you, you cannot expand these distances. And of course, you have the contraction mapping uh, principle uh, to show existence of solution of equations. But, but for linear operators, uh, group, uh, groups of matrices, you have the wonderful symmetric spaces and, uh, and buildings. And also in infinite dimension, there's some kind of a little bit less nice space uh, by necessity, which I will come to later. But that's nice that these have non-positive <coughs> curvatures, a great uh, thing. And then there are B, there are maps that are sort of come from maybe uh, more applied mathematics, like Perron, Frobenius, nonlinear versions. And then there are two cases here. K if you have a group, say a finite degenerate, it acts by isomity on its Cayley graph by translation. Or if you take a fundamental group of a compact manifold, you can take a Riemann, ma Riemannian metric and lift it and have it acting on universal <coughs> covering. Uh, <coughs> but, and then the mapping class groups and outer automorphism of free groups, they have versions of the symmetric space that they, they act on. And, uh, and for holomorphic maps, there's a, there's a, there's a simple but m miraculous fact of Schwartz peak, <coughs> the Schwartz peak lemma that says that every holomorphic map from the unit disk to itself semi-contracts the point area metric. And, and as with that as starting point, uh, there's a construction of Karate or Kubayashi that kind of propagate that property to so every complex space and every holomorphic map. So all holomorphic maps are semi-contraction, except that for some spaces, the, the metric is only a pseudo-metric, uh, semi-metric that, I mean, distance may be zero. But, uh, and there's a similar thing for symplectic morphism, Hofer metric, which I know less. But the, so there are some examples of uh, where metrics um, appear. O okay, so so what is a metric <coughs> function? So if you recall for vector space V, it's uh, c common to look at linear maps from R into V or lines, or, or linear maps from V into R, linear functionals. And so for metric spaces, it's uh, common to look at is isometries from R to X. So, so in the in the in the sort of metric geometry, this is what we mean by geodesics, and uh, you can also look at maps from X to R. But now this cannot be isometry because just like here we have a big kernel here. But so here we have we take uh, one Lipschitz or semi-contractive maps, and so we'll, so this is sort of the picture that I kind of want to advertise. So this notation is sort of factorial in the ideas, so changing the kind of category, but. 
uh, and so what's the, what's the use for linear functional? When in function analysis you define, it's quite useful to have the weak topologies and weak compactness. And so that's what we want to kind of imitate from <coughs> metric spaces. So, uh, okay, so let X be a metric space and we fix a base point. So this is like the origin, it's like zero in the vector space. <coughs> And, uh, and nothing will depend on that. Everything will be, uh, nothing depends on that point. And now we define <coughs> from each point x in your metric space, you would define a function on x. And this indicates that we take the topology of uh, pointwise convergence. And so, yeah, so each x will have a metric functional, namely basically the distance function, but then you subtract this to have it being zero at, z at the origin. So a bit similar to linear functional which vanished at the origin of the vector space so for each I don't know if it's visible but for every vector v if you have a suppose supposing you have an inner product you can take a make a linear functional and so canonic away by by uh, by taking the inner product and leaving one variable uh, so okay and now so now we have and this can be checked to be injective and continuous mm -hmm. And, but, and now we can take the closure inside the space. That would be compact by the Tikhonov uh, compactness theorem. These are, these are moreover, these are one Lipschitz. By triangle inequality, one can see that this is one Lipschitz map from X to R. <laughs> and so this would be a, a, a compact set. Now, it will not be a compactification because if, for not so, for if X is a geodesic and proper space, so proper means uh, that lo uh, b bounded, uh, close bounded sets are compact, so it's a little bit stronger version of local compactness. I in that case, there is a, it's a compactification in the usual sense, but in general, it's just a compact, and it can look a bit uh, distort uh, X in some sense. But, uh, but still, now we have sort of speak of weak uh, convergence inside this. We have some kind of weak topology uh, for a metric space. Uh, okay, and okay, as I said, this is not a new notion, uh, not at all. S so, yeah, it appears already in the Poisson integral formula, giving the, as we have heard, uh, the, the solving the Dirichlet problem in the unit disk, so having a harmonic extension of given boundary values. They're, they're a horror function are implicit. Uh, but maybe, maybe it's correct to. So it appeared also in complex analysis by the, yeah, in some other cases. But for maybe geometry, there's, uh, there's the observation of Busemann, which the date is maybe, I, I'm not so sure, but uh, so he noted that given any geodesic yeah. ray, and so this is the white thing is metric space, say, and we have a base point, and we have a, a geodesic line, so an isometric copy of, I mean, the distance on this line is what you see in the metric space. The, the, this is the shortest way. I mean, it could be another one, but this is a shortest way. So he noted that this limit always exists just by the triangle inequality makes a monotonicity and then you have a bounded, so you have a bounded monotone sequence. So there's a limit for any, in any metric space. So uh, for example, in Banach space, you can do this for a Banach space. So then you have, th and these are always convex uh, functions, so sometimes linear depending on how uh, how smooth the if the the sphere unit sphere in the Banach space is smooth uh, at, at these points, but uh, so without Han Banach we have w I mean we have these functions these function uh, functionals maybe I should say uh, and a similar notion as I said is horror function but there okay first uh, yeah so these are also limits. So I mean, I'm looking at, so why am I writing this formula? It's because, maybe if I go back. It's because we are mapping x uh, inside with phi to this space, and we take the closure. So we now we want to understand, when we take the closure, what new points do we get? What new or, or points or functions? And so th these are typical functions that we get in the limit. So we, we, we go into infinity in our metric space, and uh, we have this limiting. That's our metric functional for defined by gamma n. And the limits, we're looking at what we get in the limit. Uh, and so if you do this calculation in a Hilbert space, so Hilbert says we know linear functions are given <coughs> by 
in a product, but you can also take this. So you have a unit vector, but you can take this limit, and it's a first year undergraduate uh, calculation to show that uh, this limit give you back the inner product. And, uh, and now, <coughs> you, uh, not every space has an inner, I mean, that's sort of the idea, the, uh, not every space has an inner product, but, but this makes sense in any Banach space or any metric space. Okay, so what do we get? So there's some examples. So, as I said, the list of examples during the last 10 years is getting longer. So examples, I mean, some kind of description of, or understanding for what is compactification if I may call it compactification, this compact pr pr procedure gives you. And so for proper spaces, so, lo so say a finite dimension of Riemannian manifold simply connected of non-positive curvature, it gives you back the, this nice sphere at infinity. So here is the hyperbolic plane, it gives you back the, you, the, this circle. And uh, so B indicates a point that is infinity and the level set of B, I mean, I've drawn three. Uh, uh, th they look like that. So, and also, if you map this to a half plane, th that point to plus uh, infinity, I mean, infinity, then these cur uh, circles will become these horizontal lines in the upper half plane. So, another ex example is a. Uh, so, so now a quite different metric space. Take the standard Cayley graph of z squared. So we see the lattice here. And it continues, of course, in all directions. And, and the closure you get is you have these four points, which is th this point, for example, is plus infinity, comma, <coughs> plus infinity. And here you have a copy of z and copy of z and copy of z, copy of z. So now z squared the acts on this. So by iso because everything was naturally constructed, so the isometry extends to action of homeomorphism. So it acts on this compactification. These points are fixed, and uh, here these points at infinity are translated. And uh, here's another example of a more um, distorted example. You take the real line, but now you, you, you don't take the usual metric. So the usual metric will be by this absolute value of points, to the norm. But you destroy it. Or, or modify it by a concave sublinear function, then you, you get just a one-point compactification. So uh, this space has no geodesics, but uh, of course it has metric functionals, and you get just uh, zero functional in the end. Uh, okay, I, I put this because I was um, wanted to mention a relation to a, a, a previous result of uh, uh, Aronson <coughs> Weiss for a Gothic theorem for non-standard moments, but I think I will not uh, manage that. But but anyway, that's a metric space. Uh, and so there are many other examples, but I cannot uh, <coughs> recall. Okay, so even if you, now next topic is subadditive a Gothic theorem. So now now if you don't care about metric spaces, you maybe it's still you can still uh, I mean maybe you don't uh, okay uh, <laughs> okay you can listen to this. If you want, sorry. Uh, so, I mean, this has nothing to do with metric space. Okay, so we have seen the Fekete's lemma, as it's sometimes called. You have a sequence of numbers that had a subadditive property. It so, in, in the entropy uh, talks, it's been mentioned. Or and uh, so, this is w well known that this limit exists. Now, there is a question or, or a conjecture of ha Hammersley and Wells uh, uh, in uh, percolation probably in probability on percolation theory, I think. In the uh, mid-60s, I asked this, is there, a, is, there a ergodic, is there an extension of the ergodic theorem to sub-additive co-cycles? <laughs> so having, having a function that's so measurable in all, uh, in all ways, so indexed by n natural numbers, and omega was our measure space, and uh, we had a transformation t. And so the uh, relation to n plus m is uh, it's not greater than a n and the a m, but shifted with the t n. And Kingman found a proof in 68, or the paper is published in 68, that showed that indeed this limit exists, of course, under standard integrability condition. If, and if a1 lies in l1, they're all a n by just this, they're also in l1. So, 
So this is a very useful theorem. Uh, and th there have been simplified proofs by Katz, Nelson, Weiss, and uh, Keen, and other people. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that's a well-known theorem. So example, so the first one is, okay, stupid. It's just omega is one point. So you are back to the sequence of numbers. And th the other one is shows why it's extension of the Birkhoff ergodic theorem. <coughs> Because now, if I define a n like this, it will be a additive. So, uh, so this thing will be not only sub-additive, but actually additive. And all additive co-cycles are on that form, f in L1. And, and then an, another example where sub-additivity uh, sub appears, w which is relevant to our um, discussion. And that's having again now the random product of semi-contractions. So I take, uh, uh, okay, X is a bit unfortunate. Notation was my old because X is also the space. Uh, I forgot to change it on this one, so sorry about that. But uh, so we take the, I mean, we take uh, our favorite the transformations of this metric space and flip, a, uh, throw a dice and compose them. And we define A n, as I said in the very beginning, to be the distance from the starting point to the nth point <laughs> of our random walk. And now that distance will be then a n plus m comma omega. And now this one, now, now we know triangle inequality tells you that, uh, uh, sorry, I should, well, the, the, uh, the big one is not greater than the sum of the two smaller ones. And now you can see when you, you look at that side, you can relate it exactly to the sub-additive, um, uh, what's needed here. And, and that's by the semi-contraction. So the inequality of being, so if, if this was isometric, this would be exactly the one that's given by a n comma, or a m comma t n omega. But here with contraction, the inequality goes in the right direction. You should be multiplying in the opposite uh, yeah, okay, yeah, thanks for the point. Yeah, there's a, so in, in the matrix case, you usually multiply in the other order. But then it depends on what you act on. So if you act on metric space, you should act on the left. So this should be the way you multiply to have, because for a metric space, if you, so I want to show that it converts in direction. And if you would multiply in the other direction, then, then that one would, there was always, when, uh, when you look at as you converge, then you would apply a new transformation, but then it would flip the whole picture. So you need to multiply it this way. Or if you're on a, on a uh, say, a group and a Cayley graph, and you, the edge relation is on the right, then, then this is the way you, and you, you act by isometry by translation on the left, and th then that's the order for which the random work is. But, uh, but as far as the distance goes, it doesn't matter. I, uh, up to now, it does, I could have multiplied it the other way. For, for the, uh, it was not clear? <laughs> uh, okay, uh, sorry. Hopefully, maybe get more clear. Oh, okay, so now uh, here's a, a crucial ingredient for the, pr the progress. Uh, this year, that, uh, so that I say it's, uh, yeah, it's in our paper, but the proof was by S Sebastian Goussel. So he, it's a very complicated and intricate proof. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's several, I mean, it, it's more, I, I think it's de more delicate than the sub-additive ergodic theorem. So you not just get by, because I, I've tried, uh, not because I've tried, but, so I, I've been aware of these type of statements that I wanted to show, but uh, with the usual modification of sub-additive ergodic theorem, I, I couldn't do it, so. Um, so I was convinced that you needed a bit more, but uh, but Sebastian saw how to do this. So this is so I think this could be uh, useful in other contexts. Oh, I'm com convinced. Uh, okay. So what what is the statement? So let A be an integrable subadditive cycle with a finite limit A. So nothing having to do with metric spaces again. Now for almost every omega, we have good times. So the n i there, uh, good times. Uh, and de deltas tending to zero such that for every k fr from one to n i, this looks uh, 
additive. So, the so at these good times, the, the, the subadditive co-cycle is written here. For good times, which the co-cycle is nearly additive for all uh, k's up to ni. And so, okay, th this is just by subadditivity, right? This is subadditivity, but I just remind you of this. But, but here, that this delta is turning to zero is the content. So we have, so the subadditive cosec looks additive at certain times for, let me see. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. If an is a constant subadditive yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, it is. Actually, so instead of doing, yeah, this proof is, I don't know, six, seven, I mean, this is not for, for I mean, you can look at the paper, but it's not for, for here. But yeah, for a constant sequence, uh, it's possible to explain. Yeah, so, but the uh, perfect question that uh, by coincidence I'd prepare the answer. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. So, so given a subadditive sequence, so we write it, so that's the limit, uh, the average averaging limit, and so we write this epsilon n, and epsilon thus tends to zero. Okay, and now I fix some kappa goes to zero, and uh, I let b and i to be a n minus this. And this makes that no matter, even if a is zero, this, this sequence, and even if yeah, a n is bounded, th this sequence is, will be unbounded in n because we have subtracted this. So you have an unbounded. But then you, you pick n i to be, you could pick this one or that one or that one. Eventually you want to pick n i tending to infinity, which is bigger than all the previous ones. And so this is a graph of uh, b n i. So now if you ca sort of small calculation, you write this, um, the defect of being uh, additive. Uh, you go back. You write it in terms of the B n, so you just have to add back uh, the stuff that is missing. Now most of it disappears now, but you have the that uh, A n cancels out this one, and the A n and the A k also cancels. But there's there's something that doesn't cancel this thing, and then the the fact that that uh, by the choice of of uh, maybe I should be. By the choice of the ni, the, the, this one is bigger than by this. So they go away. And now I get back. And so with the, and the, the, the de delta <coughs> cannot be the maximum of kappa i and epsilon. So how do you choose ki just to make it? Uh, uh, the ni, yeah, ni picked, uh, I guess. Kappa. Uh, oh, kappa, oh, fix just uh, fix uh, something. Such that yeah. the, the, the goes sequence. to zero. Yeah, yeah, just any sequence going to zero, That's just to zero squeeze sequence. it. Yeah. No, no, it's a positive. Okay, it should be a positive numbers tending to zero. F fix cap i, a positive sequence <coughs> tending to zero. Monotonically. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Monotonically. Yeah, why not? One over i. Yeah. One over i. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, okay. Maybe I should have. Been, I, I guess it's a matter of taste. Maybe one over i is, is good enough. Yeah. Uh, so we have, so at least I <coughs> provided some explanation for uh, for this in the constant, non-random case. Okay, so now how to apply this uh, for the uh, multiplicate or non-commutative ergodic theorems. So uh, a remark while I remember. So uh, as uh, as Hillel uh, pointed out uh, at the dinner. Uh, um, that ergodic theory is interactive with many subjects, and so I, I'm not sure if it was mentioned, but uh, during the conference, but th there is a for rigidity theory, ergodic theory was uh, y useful. So, for example, it started with the f first time I, he considered questions using random walks, where the l lattices, if they could uh, know which enveloping Lie uh, Li group it belongs to, and so by using st random walks, and that. Uh, uh, influenced Mostow for his strong rigidity, who I which influenced also Margulis in turn, who used the uh, oscillated multiplicative ergodic theorem to prove this uh, super and rigidity and arithmeticity. So, uh, uh, a remarkable d development. So, this used the uh, multiplicative 
a Gaudic theorem for proving something in, uh, say, in geometry or, or representation theory. Okay, and this is still going strong uh, today. So Uri Bader, for example, in his work, uh, <coughs> that that boundary using boundary theory and random walks for rigidity questions and the uh, studies of l lattices. Okay, so uh, let me recall again the main theorem. So we have the ergodic measure preserving transformation of me measure total measure one. You have a metric space X. We're given a, a sort of random variable taking uh, um, taking value in <coughs> non-expanding map of this metric space, and we have integrability, and we have to assume also measurability, of course, everywhere, and f and form this uh, this uh, sequence. And now the order is important. Uh, UN uh, is now the random product or, or the random walk on your group or semigroup, and then for almost every omega, there exists a metric function that maybe I should have emphasized. It depends. It depends on omega, just like the random walk on, you, uh, on the hyperbolic plane. We we know it escapes, uh, and with what rate? But uh, where it converts on the boundary is a random phenomenon. It's not deterministic. But while this, the linear rate of escape, of random walk is deterministic. Uh, and so so we have this. So so we re recall that we need to find this h, this metric function. And so, how, how do we do that? So, <coughs> l let yn of omega be the points of the trajectory. So, so we, we, we can just think of any point, actually, that satisfies sub-additivity, which actually we will use later, if I get to there. Uh, <coughs> but uh, typically, I'm thinking of the sort of the random walk uh, trajectory. So, omega is the randomness, and n is time n, and you apply it to the starting point. So, here's the starting point. Uh, okay, so this, as discussed, is a sub-additive co-cycle. And for good times, the, the sub-additive theorem that I displayed sh gi gives you that at these good times, uh, uh, the, so say N1, N2, N3, uh, the picture is sort of this, that the, the defect, it's very close to being additive. So in, the, so in that way, you, you kind of see how in some sense, the direction is forming, <laughs> at least along the ni. Uh, so in formulas, if you're not convinced of this, uh, uh, the formulas is, so we take the metric functional defined by, by say, th that point, and then you look at some yk that could, could be this point, but some other point. And that, by definition, is the distance, uh, that distance, minus, like in the, in the Busemann picture, that, that distance minus this distance, which then by uh, semi-contraction is prob uh, yeah, may maybe I need an inequality there, but uh, in any case, <coughs> the inequality goes the right way. So in, in the, the upshot is that for such ni and such k, we have this lower estimate. And now uh, with this delta k tending to zero and all k here, now we can take limit points because of compactness, the weak compactness. You can take limit points, um, so either sequential or some uh, other procedure using compactness, th that, uh, um, so we have a l limit of these guys, so these guys that look very straight, that move in kind of definite in <coughs> way. So for a, for a limit, so such a limit, H, applied to YK, we have this estimate. But now we are done because that's the non-trivial estimate. The upper <coughs> estimate, so we want the other inequality, but that's just by uh, Kingman and that the map H is one Lipschitz. So that, you, so that we get uh, for free. But, the, but the, the that this says that the trajectory moves definitely inside the horribles of H. Okay, so that's the, that's the end of the proof. Uh, OK, so let's see if. OK, so here's a version in Banach spaces. So if, suppose you don't like uh, metric functional, but there's, you, OK, either you can use the metric functional and say that uh, by Han Banach, there's a metric linear functional that kind of minorizes it. Or you can just repeat the same argument that I had here, but use instead linear functionals in Han Banach. And you can show that, so given any, integral ergodic cycle of non-expanding map of a, 
Banach space. Then for almost every <coughs> omega, there is a linear function of norm one. So that's the like one Lipschitz. Okay, so to, to, I mean, that's why it makes it that it matches this. The, ah, yeah, here I should have, I forgot, here I should have norm. Sorry. <coughs> so this is the norm in the Banach space. We can think of x as just being zero. Like, and, uh, and so we have this uh, kind of weak convergence, which is, so suppose there's a Hilbert, if, if x was a Hilbert space, this implies that this sequence un of omega actually converges to a vector in the strong sense. And the, and the picture is uh, something like this. You have a zero, you iterate, and you escape, and there is some linear function whose level set I've drawn kind of, it moves in that direction, provided this is positive. And the non-random version of study here in Jerusalem, a Parsi in 72 for, Hi for Hilbert metric, uh, no, no, for Hilbert space case. Uh, so Parsi is a professor here. From what I understand, he also was at, for a few years president of the Hebrew University. Yeah. Uh, and they called by Neiman, uh, they have a very nice paper where they actually have this weak uh, version with the linear functional. Be because as they noted that uh, it's not true, uh, the strong convergence is not true for any Banach space. But this statement is always true. Uh, and, and, uh, and an extension of plant Reich. And uh, yeah, called by Neiman, I saw they have a new preprint in 2015, February. I, I think they work on economics and game theory, so with other subject. But uh, so they, I think they were also here, maybe at the institute uh, around those years. Oh, he's sorry, he's sorry. Oh, okay, yeah, I see. <laughs> yeah, so I, I hope I, yeah, but yeah, very nice paper. Uh, so, uh, and, and just to remind you, this also implies a mean ergodic theorem because if you take a, so I, I will not explain the randomness, it's just you add randomness, but this is the, just the mean ergodic. You have just one U, otherwise you can take random, I mean, <coughs> make another, yeah, you can take a random product of U's, but. So U is a linear operator, norm at most one, and say X is a Hilbert space, and you define the associated semi-contraction, non-expanding map, which is not the linear now, because we translate by, say, a vector V. Now, if you look at the iterate of zero, you get back this uh, ergodic uh, uh, average, which, uh, so the, the, the main, the first ergodic theorem of von Neumann also, Kahleman around the same time, Ries, who made this extension to having not unitary operator necessarily, and there has been random versions. But the, so we provide o almost as good random uh, mean ergodic theorem as the one in beck schwartz But one point I want to make is that, so uh, our result is uh, sort of as general as you can imagine, but it's a weak, so it's weak enough to be true always, but, but it's strong enough to when you have an additional nice structure of the metric space, or in this case, the Banach space, you, you have something that's true still, some kind of weaker convergence than this, because this is not true for all Banach space, <laughs> that you have this convergence. Okay, so going to uh, linear operators, so finish. So I sh should maybe mention the, the multiplicative ergodic theorem of Oseled is uh, published in 68. There was also some prelim other version I have been told by Milion Skirovich around the same time, but uh, I don't know exactly the history of that, but uh, <coughs> oh, and before that, uh, there is uh, the first of Kesten theorem that s s they showed before the Kingman's theorem that that uh, the norm of the, now I multiply the way that uh, it's more common, but, but I mean, it's when you take this action on the symmetric space, you'll get the, the actions kind of get transposed, so you get the o other <coughs> order. But that, uh, the, the norm was, uh, so it's kind of random spectral norm existed. But here also, uh, okay, I haven't written here, there's existing filtration of subspaces and, and V belong, depending on which subspace it belongs to, there's a corresponding Lyapunov exponent. But this is not true. So, so this, so we, I mean, that follows on the main theorem when applied to GLNR as the group of isometry of the symmetric space of the po say, positive definite symmetric uh, matrix. 
uh, as was noticed maybe by uh, Kaimanovic uh, many years ago. Um, the, at least, uh, no, no, not for horror fraction, but for some other consideration symmetrical. Okay, but in infinite dimension, these exponents don't exist. So, for example, you can take a, uh, suppose you take a, yeah, an infinite sequence space and you multiply by 2 for a while and then multiply by 3 for a longer while and then you multiply by 2 for an even longer while, etc. But then you add a shift. And now if you apply some vector, then you will not have, you, in one regime you will multi can look like you multiply by, uh, okay, this thing by 2 and other it looks like it's by 3. And so this may not exist, this kind of spectral theorem for general bounded operators. And okay, in some sense it's a little bit related to the notorious invariant subspace problem. But for an infinite dimension, so, so I think there's some interest in multiplicative ergodic theorem in infinite dimensions. The first one by Ruel in the 70s and motivated by differential <coughs> dynamics, but also some dynamics coming from equations like Navier-Stokes, which becomes some flow on Hilbert space. And so, <coughs> so there's been some work on that. Uh, but okay, so in view of that, we cannot have oscillated, even if we had just one matrix, no, so no randomness. Uh, we, we do have the following, uh, which is the same, this philosophy, our statement is so weak that it, that it always holds, but then, okay, what it means uh, depends on the <coughs> how, how nice your space is. But, so take an integral ergodic cosine bound in invertible linear operators of a Hilbert space, and you take the positive part of the, as I denoted, it's this, and I have the cosecule V instead of U because I have that order. Uh, and now there exists a linear, uh, f so, yeah, linear functional of norm one on the space of bounded linear operators such that you have this, uh, that here, here, uh, here again I forgot the norm. So the, the how it grows in norm, so like the random spectral radius is, is uh, <laughs> you can kind of, you don't have a Lyapunov exponent, but you have something <coughs> weaker. And uh, the proof for this goes via uh, the space of symmetric space in infinite dimensions. So the space of positive operators. This was studied by, in particular, Korash Porta Recht, uh, for, for, I think a uh, school in uh, Argent Argentina. And, uh, and uh, there's a property that's kind of weak. So one nice property of symmetric space of non-compact type is the non-positive curvature. And there is a weak version of that, which is the completely equivalent to the Siegel's inequality for U and V symmetric operators. Uh, so you have some kind of replacement. Th this makes us, if, if, so we could have formulated this in terms of metric functional, but since metric functional are not, uh, so they haven't been studied in this setting, so we can go to something more traditional as linear function. And so we have a random walk on this curved manifold, the Riemannian manifold of positive metric, and then we lift it back up to the symmetric space, uh, to the tangent space. And thanks to this inequality, this, the inequality goes the right or way, so we have again a sub-additive si uh, set uh, system of, of points, and then we can apply this argu argument that I explained, uh, and one gets this for for whatever it's worth, but, but it's something. And uh, okay, let me just maybe historically, why I should have started also by theorem of wolf tonsure is that's great. This, if you take f a holomorphic map, then either there's a fixed point. Or uh, the orbit, any orbit converges to a certain point of inf at this boundary. And also, the, these whole cycle, cycles, that they are invariant sets, um, th these were noted by, by Wolf. So, in some sense, the, that picture of the Wolf Donchua theorem, <laughs> or the picture I started the talk with, with this random walk in hyperbolic space, is kind of. Um, <coughs> kind of the first instances of this phenomenon. And, uh, another one is the, uh, yeah, some other ergodic theorem, like the mean ergodic theorem. And so we get, of course, then random version of this. And, but, uh, okay, so I, I've, I've heard that talks should have jokes and proofs and, uh, and open problems. So, uh, okay, so since the, uh, the invariant subspace problem does probably doesn't, uh, I cannot count that uh, as my, Suggested. That's a joke. That's a joke. Oh, oh yeah, maybe. That's, that's <coughs> <good>. <coughs> so, 
so let me just, I came up with two things. So suppose you have uh, a finite degenerated group, or you have a random walk on a calligraph, and uh, now how does this, uh, the metric function you get at the limit, so some kind of heating measure, how does it relate to the Poisson boundary? And so when x, so when x, uh, when you have a group acting by isometry on a global hyperbolic space or a, or a cat zero space, then the Kamanois ray approximation criterion applies and so gives the answer that the, the answer is y yes, it gives uh, the, the Poisson first number boundary. And other, other question one could ask, uh, which I haven't thought so much about, but that's also true for, but just by geometry for hyperbolic and global uh, and cat zero spaces, that you can consider limits for any other functional. So we here we found one good one that kind of explained the, the convergence of direction, but you can ask if these limits exist uh, just as limits for any H. Okay, so with this, uh, I thank you for your attention. Oh yeah, definitely. Also Thank you. Yeah. What, what time? <coughs> is uh, uh, oh. Middle of seventies. Ah, okay. Sorry, I'm overlooked it. Thank you. And secondly, about this age, yeah. this is true for a new pattern group, for example, uh, the existence of such an uh, age. Uh, okay. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, existence of age. Yes, but. Uh, but what's the question? Oh, here. Oh, just so I, I so so the 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 the. the sort of what I call the multiplicative ergodic theorem was that there exists an H such that this limit, okay, with a negative, yeah. but is exactly the rate of escape, the speed. But now I, one can ask, uh, okay, take another H, unrelated to the process. Uh, and do they always have the, this, this average converge? Now, if that's interesting, uh, I'm not so sure, but it's a question that nobody considered probably. <laughs> 